Hello and welcome back to Documentary Film. And this is Module 2 entitled Styles of Documentary. Last week we talked about modes of documentary and now we're going to include the modes in within the general styles of documentary. Before I go any further, just a reminder that when all this is done, there will be a viewing and a reading quiz that will open tomorrow, January 18th, and will stay open until the 24th. So the viewing quiz which is, uh, will be on our feature presentation, Nanook of the North, and the reading quiz will be on the same subject, but it will be based on the readings, page 1 to 18 of the textbook for this course. So both on Nanook, one, on, uh, one is a reading, the other is a viewing. So let's kind of take a look at uh, the ideas that we've already sort of explored as of last week, the six modes of documentary, and start to ask ourselves, uh, what is it about documentary filmmaking that makes it different from fiction? Clearly, it's about truth telling. So here are some thoughts. Now, we've not looked at the, or discussed John Grierson a whole lot. I mentioned him last week a little bit. He was a British filmmaker working in the 1920s and early 30s. He uh, actually moved to Canada and started up the, the National Film Board. So he is an important character in Canadian filmmaking, uh, in particular, Canadian documentary filmmaking. And so that's what he was famous for. He was, he was the person that was an advocate for the documentary tradition as uh, explanatory, expository, educational. And he truly believed that documentary films could educate individuals. We could watch something for 15, 20 minutes, half an hour, and actually learn something from them. They wouldn't just be entertaining. It would also be educational. So what did Grierson argue that documentaries were supposed to, to be? Well, educational tools. Uh, and so what, um, what Grierson wanted us to consider was the ability of the film to be factual and truthful for us so that we could actually learn something from it. Uh, the scene that you'll be watching from the drifters is like, I, like I said, the first six minutes of the film before that first fade to black and there you kind of get an overall tone of what the the film is like uh it is a leisurely pace but it certainly has some ideas that it wishes to present to us visually uh certainly there is the natural world we see birds and we see water but we start seeing very quickly the encroachment of culture the encroachment of economics and uh the activities of individuals and how we interact for better or worse of course with nature we see, you know, belching smoke out of smokestacks. Uh, we see motors that are running and coal that needs to be fed into the fire. So there is a real sort of uh, interaction between nature and culture or nature and individuals. And that's really kind of what Grierson wanted us to, to consider, that this is, this is a changing world, right? This is a very uh, pronouncedly changed world, uh, again, at that time for the better. But uh, certainly since, since the Second World War, we have now become much more aware of things like pollution, right? And uh, waste in the oceans and things like that, things that concern us now. But back then, Grierson was looking to educate viewers about this changing landscape. Uh, this landscape now where, you know, tugboats and, and boats are out there, uh, not just to sort of, you know, wander around the seacoast, but in fact, engaged in work, engaged in fishing, engaged in doing things that are going to move the economy along. So uh, Grierson is not asking us to sort of ask provocative, probing, reflexive questions. He did want us to watch the film, but at the same time, he wanted us to, imp to have imparted to us knowledge about this changing landscape in, in England. And that's really kind of what is, what is going on in the films. So the question now is, what is a documentary, right? What is a, what is a filmic document? Okay, um, it's sort of a genre like the Western or the horror, um, romantic comedy, a musical, th those are genres. So if that's the case, then what is a documentary? Well, it, it's a kind of filmmaking. And certainly you could include within a fiction film uh, what's called stock footage. And stock footage is, uh, could be, you know, footage from a war, or from some kind of natural disaster. So, well, there, there's an actual document within a fictional setting. Now, does that change the genre of the musical or the comedy or whatever? No. Uh, but it is an insertion of some kind of factual information. 
So what do we talk about when we talk about documentary? So it's a category, right? It's a type of film. Uh, and there's a huge range, right? We can talk about newsreels, which used to be often the only way that people would get news, at least visual news, uh, up until about the 19, let's say the late 1950s, when uh, enough people had televisions that news was now being delivered through television sets rather than theaters. Uh, newsreels certainly were very popular, and these would be uh, played usually before the features, and they could be as short as five minutes and some 15, 20 minutes. And we'll get into the details of the, um, the, the order of the day, right? The news of the day. Certainly around the Second World War, people wanted to know exactly what was going on uh, in Europe, what was happening, you know, were our, were our boys safe and these kinds of things. Well, newsreel, newsreels would provide that. Uh, Nonfiction films are essentially what documents are or documentaries. They can be experimental. Uh, we talked uh, uh, last week about poetic films, films that seem to not have a clear narrative. They seem to be more concerned with setting a mood or uh, cutting on, on shape or movement or color or, or characters. It seems to be interested in something other than sim the, the simple depiction of individuals. It's trying to say something more, but it does in a very progressive uh, fashion that really allow, uh, asks us and allows us to engage with the film as something other than a piece of nonfiction. Now, television broadcasts, which have become very, very popular since the 1960s even, uh, but we've had Nightline, Dateline, 60 Minutes, uh, you know, uh, game shows can be documents, right, because they're reality and they're usually unexpected. Uh, reality TV, and that's kind of a dicey one because yes, it is a documentary, uh, about actual people, but reality TV carves up reality uh, into small sort of digestible bits and can make people look very different than who they really are. And keep that in mind when we're when you watch the first five minutes and the last ten minutes of, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Leonard Cohen, because it is a kind of reality TV document, but uh, there is. There's a self-awareness on behalf of Leonard Cohen, the main, the main subject of the film, about the fact that he's being filmed. And so he's very self-aware. So his, his actions are often performative, right? He's clearly performing for the camera. And I don't mean doing a song and dance, but clearly aware that the camera is there filming him. So he's very conscious of his movements, the cadence of his voice, the way he looks at people, because all that visual language translates and and informs the viewing uh, the viewing effect the overall effect of the film um, and finally uh, there are docudramas these are films that are based on actual people jfk walk the line to be johnny cash uh eat pray love an author whose name i just suddenly slipped my mind but the, these are again uh, either docudramas or documentaries there is some degree of truth some degree of reality and of course keep those words always in quotations because both of those are merely approximations okay so when we were talking about a documentary uh grierson his very famous quote is what he considered to be the creative treatment of actuality now right off the bat hmm creativity involves uh intentionality involves constructing and reconstructing actuality, reality, to suit a certain purpose. So Grierson wasn't lying to us that, you know, I've, I have manipulated this, this, uh, this information, this visual information I have reconstructed. I'm going to represent it to you in a way that makes you think of certain things. So this very famous quote, the creative treatment of actuality is a very loaded comment a very loaded idea because it really reflects and echoes all through the history of documentary because we are certainly allowed even with the lightest of cameras even if you're shooting on an iphone once you have that document that visual information you still reserve the right to edit it to chop it down to construct it reconstruct it reform it in any which way you want you could hold shots longer than it is, was necessary. Uh, you can have very short shots. You can have inserts. You can have, you know, cutaway shots. And that's not even talking about sound, about music, uh, about how you're going to sort of create this overall presentation, this, this creative treatment of actuality. Because 
That essentially is what the documentary is doing. It is taking reality or actuality and representing it to us. Now, another famous uh, line, uh, a factual film, which is dramatic. Uh, again, it hints at two different things. The fact that the documentation is factual. These are real people. This occurred in front of the camera. But as we'll find out with Nanook of the North, uh, what we see that takes place in front of the camera was not something that was chance. It wasn't aleatory. And we'll get to that word in a moment. It wasn't chance. These were staged. So is it a factual film? Does that matter? Right? Is the creative treatment of actuality, that sounds like that's kind of after the filming has been done or a factual film, which is dramatic. Again, the same kind of thing is going on here where the material is being looked at and is being shaped so that it points to one main idea and things that don't point to that, that idea are left on the cutting room floor. So are documentary filmmakers lying to us when they, when they say that? They're making us aware that they are constructed. So we shouldn't be surprised that the film is shaped in a certain way. It isn't just raw footage uh, because raw footage, the only film I can think of that I know of right now is I believe an eight hour film called Empire. And this was a film made in the 1960s by Andy Warhol. And it was basically a camera placed in front of the Empire State Building and it ran for eight hours. And that was the film. So whatever happened in front of the camera over that eight hour period was it. It was literally raw footage. No uh, editing, no uh, restructuring or reforming of that material was made. Now that's a very unusual exercise and certainly not a typical documentary film. So we need to keep in mind and accept the fact that these films are structured, right? It is a creative treatment of actuality. So let's now take this idea that reality is shaped in a certain way and go back and take a look at our, our modes of, of documentary, not genres, but modes. So moments, uh, stylistic uh, changes. And the four kind of main ones I think you're going to experience throughout this, um, you know, this course are the following four. Expository. This is the traditional, uh, whether it's Robert Flaherty's silent film, John Grierson's early sound films, but this is this, the kind of voice of God narration, they call it. Uh, we've got interviews that always move the, narr the narrative towards that same main point, the main thesis of the film. Everyone speaks about it and heads towards it. But the notion of the voice of God narration also has to do with the fact that the voice uh, is primary. The image is simply service the voice, service what is being discussed. And one of the best ways to do it is you can either have an intertitle, which was what we see in Nanook of the North, or we have location footage and we have a voiceover that tells us where we are, what it is we're looking at, uh, who these people that, who, that we, are, we are watching through the camera lens. So there's never a, an attempt to confuse the viewer in expository film or to lie to them or to make them, make them somehow think that what is being seen does not match up with what's being heard. So it is uh, a very straightforward, again, a voice of God narration that is very clear in its purpose and presenting to us a clear idea. The thesis is clear, it's identifiable. Now, the second one is observational. Uh, and here we're gonna talk a little bit about direct cinema this idea of uh, the camera is kind of a fly in the wall. Uh, the filmmaker does not engage with the subject, does not interview the subject, does not tell the subject to do something. Uh, often there's no narration. The, the idea is that the film is sort of presented in its totality. And of course, that's after it's been edited and music has been put onto it and so on. Choices have been made as to the, the structure uh, and the interrelationship between shots. So there's all that creative treatment we have just talked about but it is still for the most part observational in the sense that the filmmaker and the camera does not intrude or control in some way the events depicted in front of the camera. So it is in that sense of flying the wall. The third is participatory, quite the opposite, right? So there is an engagement, right? The filmmaker engages with the subject matter either off screen through uh, asking uh, interview questions or could be even the main star of the film. 
um, uh, um, Michael Moore films. Um, the, the Super Size Me is another one. Films where the, the director is seen and heard uh, in the film. Uh, Errol Morris films, sometimes we can hear him asking questions. He typically is not on screen, but we know that he's there because we can hear him asking questions. So it is participatory in that way. Or what uh, the French would call cinema verité, uh, translates to truth cinema. This idea that what we're seeing uh, is a direct engagement between the filmmaker and the subjects. The film filmmakers have an impact on what's going on. Uh, cinema uh, verité has been around now since, well, it first started in the early 1950s. Uh, and it is, again, quite the opposite from observational, sort of fly in the wall kind of filmmaking. The fourth is uh, reflexive. And this is something that's a little bit more uh, common today. But we did see a very interesting early example last week, Las Hurdes, which is reflexive in the sense that it acknowledges and plays with the construction of a documentary film. And it plays with it in the sense specifically of what the narrator is saying versus what we are seeing. There is at, at times a disjunction between these two things. And not that it's confusing, but it causes us to question the, the veracity of the image, or more importantly, why the filmmaker happens to show us this at this time. What is their hidden agenda, their, their intent uh, for the viewer to, to respond, right? What are they expecting us to respond to or with? So if it is outrage as, as, at how horrible it is to live in that region of, of Spain, then that was the direct intent of the filmmaker. But he does it in a way that is, uh, it's more formal. So it has to do with the form of the of the of the film itself. Uh, now, formal as opposed to content, because we see the content, we hear the voices, but it is formally how they are put together, how they are constructed, whether they are expository and the voice of God guides us through this material or it is reflect uh, reflexive or reflective. And it is asking us to not rely so much on the the veracity of the voice. We need to maybe question what we're seeing as well as hearing. So it makes for a different kind of filmic experience, to say the least. So uh, documentary films were, uh, were in fact the very, for, very first types of films that were made, uh, 1895 to 1900. And these uh, these were very short films. Uh, the clip that we saw, or not the clip, but this uh, um, uh, picture here is from uh, the arrival of, of, a, of a train in the station. And that's what it was called, I think, 1898. So when this film was shown, at least this is what it says in the history books, when this film was shown the first time, people freaked out. They Some ducked under their seats, some ran screaming to the back of the hall, thinking that the train was literally coming through the wall. Uh, it's an interesting statement because uh, it makes you wonder, well, first of all, since when are trains in the outside world only in black and white? But remember, you're seeing movement an image moving for the first time. So the fact that it's black and white is kind of secondary, but you're seeing this big honking train coming right at you through the wall. So apparently that's what happened. It looked so lifelike. So these early films were just basically documenting the world. Um, kids playing, a train arriving in a, in a station, cars driving around, people walking around on the streets, uh, someone having a haircut, all kinds of things. Uh, but these were simply uh, just documents about the world in the same way that a painter would paint a picture or at this point, a photography, photography was also very popular. Uh, photography had been around since about the early 1840s, like 1843, I believe, one of the very first images. So photography was also around, but people were just busying themselves documenting the world around them. And that's really the, the genesis of the documentary tradition was simply photographing what was going on around them. So those are the early ones. Um, the the doc, first actual documentaries, because remember these first ones I've just talked about, the arrival of the train, for example, they're typically no, no more than about a minute or two. So the notion of a of a story or a narrative, it's, it's too short. There's not enough. It's a simply a documentation of something. But the documentary as a, as a film, as a tradition, really comes into being 
uh, 19 to, uh, 1900 to 1930. I would say in particular between 1920 and 1930, especially in, the, in that period, that decade, because we have travelogues, we've got uh, documentaries of exotic places. Uh, Nanuka the North is a very good example. Las Herdes is also a good example of that kind of filmmaking. Visiting a place w that we have not experienced or seen before. And so travelogue documentaries could be a kind of subcategory uh, to which the film that we saw last week, Las Herdes and Nanuka the North could belong. Uh, but it also could be a kind of newsreel. Now, in the case of Las Herdes, a very strange newsreel because we're kind of left scratching our heads going, well, these people are in a really bad state. Like, what can I do to help? So uh, these are, again, early forms of the newsreel. Now, as documentaries began to sort of develop on their own, newsreels were kind of an offshoot where uh, it was simply uh, a documenting of a, of a newsworthy story because that's really what a newsreel was. It wasn't trying to tell a story, but it was trying to impart to the viewer some important historical fact that was going on. So we have here the newsreel that as much as possible tries to be a straightforward voice of God expository documentary, but already, even at this early point, as soon as the document, documentary is, is a style of filmmaking or a kind of filmmaking, there is already the idea of manipulation, right? The creative treatment of actuality. And we see that very early on in Las Herdes and Nanuka the North. And we'll talk about that some more. So, um, the first sort of documentaries that were seen in theaters, uh, the 30s and 40s. And as you can imagine, you know, with the Second World War, this becomes something very important that needs to be documented. Uh, also, too, there's the invention of much lighter cameras in the, in the 1940s as well. So it allows filmmakers to be able to, to film outdoors, film under, uh, under duress, uh, under sort of, uh, you know, climactic conditions that might not otherwise be favorable, extreme cold or heat or rain. And so the cameras were more robust. They, they were uh, designed to be operated outside, not just inside a studio, which is typically where they were. So with lightweight cameras uh, and lightweight audio equipment, so now you can basically shoot, as they say, on the fly, right? You can, you can capture your audio and your video together and put it together later on. Uh, that allows for manipulation and experimentation. So as you can see, here we are in 2021. The documentary tradition has been around for over, well, 100 years, well over 100 years. Let's say if we start in the 1900s. It's been around for about 120 years uh, in, an, in an, an identifiable form. But as early as the 19, late 20s and early 30s, filmmakers were already experimenting, right, with that creative treatment of actuality. So even though on a formal level, the actual structure of the film, there is experimenting, um, the subject matter still is relatively the same. It is essentially real people, actual people who live and work and, and you know do certain things, and they are filmed by the filmmaker for whatever reason. Um, this is compared to fictional characters. Fictional characters that come out of books or are created st strictly for a fiction film. So the subject matter is real people doing real things in front of a camera. Now, when you compare the, uh, the fictional world, which creates a, a world of its own, it could be a science fiction world, it could be a futuristic world, a, a utopia, a dystopia, it doesn't matter. But fiction creates its own world. Uh, one film that's coming down the pipe in the next six months or so, um, the, the film Dune. The film Dune, which takes place in a distant future on other planets, and it creates a world utterly its own, utterly unique. And the, the book series, the three that I know of, um, it takes a long time to create this world in the imagination as the reader goes through slowly, you know, reading through it. Um, the fiction world is that. It's a, it's a fictional created world. The documentary, by comparison, goes out into the world that already exists. The documentary, documentary filmmaker uses their lightweight equipment, uh, audio and video, goes out into the world to capture some facet, some aspect of the world for whatever reason. So uh, the topic could literally be anything. 
it could be um it, well it could be war right which has uh, been typically the the mainstay of uh, filmmaking in the 1940s but it could be political issues it could be um speaking and interviewing individuals that witnessed historical events um we could be watching and observing nature uh we could be following you know important people uh important people that at this particular time. I mean, the Leonard Cohen film, for example, is exactly that. Uh, Leonard Cohen is just kind of coming into being as a poet. Uh, I don't think he started the music career at this point, but he's known as a, he's a world famous poet. So he's a remarkable person. So the film follows this, this individual around. Okay, so we talked about the documentary film as the creative treatment of actu actuality, or the dramatic treatment of actuality as well. But some of the stylistic qualities which we need to remember, uh, the most important one is the direct address narration, that voice of God, right? The viewer knows exactly what's going on. There is no confusion. Uh, we have a direct address that acknowledges the subject of the film, continually addresses it, makes sure that everything, every shot is at the service of this idea, of this main thesis. Uh, we will see interviews where people are speaking uh, either directly into the camera or just off the camera, implying that there's someone there sitting uh, that is asking them questions. And it could be, in fact, the voiceover narration that poses the question. And on screen, we see someone respond to it. But there is either on or off screen, someone controlling the narrative, someone controlling the flow of information. And ultimately, the, the narrator, right, the narration tells us how to understand and interpret the images that we are seeing. There is no confusion, no anxiety, no um, misunderstanding. The, this kind of direct address narration really leaves nothing to chance because the notion is the film is trying to teach us something. So other stylistic qualities, uh, the aleatory treatment. Uh, aleatory is just a big fancy word that just means chance or haphazardness. And it's not often that we see uh, something like that happening in real time. The only film that pops in my head right now is uh, Harlan Counter USA. I uh, saw that years ago in film school. And there's a, there's a sequence about halfway through the film where something has just happened. And the filmmakers got there too late. So they figured, let's film you know, the reactions of people. And it is this very sort of by chance, you know, because they weren't there. Uh, and, and basically, the goons came out and tried to, to clobber the strikers because it is about a, a coal mine strike, uh, Harlan County, that is. And the goons just came out and started pounding on these people. And when people called uh, to for, for help or the police, they these guys took off. In the meantime, one of the calls was made to the filmmakers who got there as quickly as they could. Uh, Barbara Kaplan, I believe, was the, the filmmaker. And they got there too late. But there are people that are in bad shape and they're saying, oh, my God, this happened, this happened. So they witnessed something. And that chance encounter with the goons, unfortunately, the filmmakers weren't there. But we have something immediately after. There's a real sense of urgency in that in that sequence. It's quite remarkable. So uh, there is always the, the opportunity uh, of something happening by chance or happenstance. The handheld camera movements allow us, uh, or allows the filmmaker to reframe constantly, to always stay focused on what's going on. Uh, there could be fixed camera positions if it is a either a long take. We see quite a few long takes in Nanook, uh, mainly because the filmmaker wants us to really understand just how huge this space is that Nanook is living in, like this vast wasteland, well, wasteland, a uh, vast land of ice, of ice and snow, a wasteland to us, but obviously where these people live. So there could be a fixed camera position to give us a sense of the vastness of that of that uh, landscape. Uh, it could also be fixed because we are watching an interview. So it's rare that interviews are done using handheld cameras, unless these are things that are done, again, on the fly, right? They are aleatory. Um, there are maps and charts. There could be animation for further explanatory purposes. Uh, there could be long, sh long shots instead of close-ups. Um, we now get a sense of where we are uh, because usually a long shot does that. It kind of establishes where we are. And then the film sort of moves in and gets to a kind of a, a close-up. This is what I'd like you to think about and see. Uh, grainy images are one way in which you can make it, uh, well, at least remind people that it is a, uh, it is a, a documentary film. Uh, one thing that reality TV does 
to trick us into thinking that we're watching a quote unquote documentary is these two, the handheld camera movement and the grainy image. Because what that does is it tricks us. It's a, it's a visual cue that when viewers kind of fall into this complacent sort of viewing pattern, especially on TV, we tend to forget that this is, okay, maybe a documentary, uh, but it is constructed. And so what happens periodically is that, you know, the camera jiggles or, or there's a bad shot or something is out of focus for, for a few seconds. It's just to remind us, oh, yes, look at all these, you know, these, uh, chance things that are occurring. They're not. They're not chance. Everything is structured. Put it this way. Think of the, the TV series that's been on for about 4,000 years. I think Survivor. I think it's still on. I haven't watched TV for years, but the, the series Survivor reality TV, one of the earliest, uh, you know, examples of it. That entire series, that entire season is completely shot, probably shot. I think over a period of about two weeks, it's completely shot. And then it's taken into the studios in Hollywood and then chopped up. So what that means is there's no chance. There's no happenstance because everything's been filmed. All that happens after that is the filmmaker and the editor sit down and chop up everything so that there are stories and sub stories. Uh, and you know, one character that really appears to, to us as being just this horrible person, like this guy will never win. Oh, look at that. All of a sudden he ends up winning. Oh, and he wins his $50,000. That's storytelling. So at what point does the document sort of shift slightly from documenting chance encounters to just telling a story or a narrative story with, you know, uh, heroes and villains and so on? That's what Survivor is. So we need to be careful when we see those to, to know that we are in fact watching a documentary. Okay. So the truth. And again, as you can see, the truth in quotations, our expectations with documentaries that we're going to see something objective and authentic. It may be authentic. It did occur in front of the camera. Uh, objectivity is something that is very difficult to achieve. We can strive towards it. Uh, direct cinema, uh, try to with this kind of fly in the wall, lightweight equipment where there's no interaction with the subjects or no interaction with individuals in the scene. So it tries to be objective, but these kinds of words, objective, authentic, reality, truth, be careful with those because they are simply, uh, approaches, right? We're, we're going to appear to be objective, appear to be authentic because there is ultimately just a pretense of objectivity. Um, and in the end also too, because of editing and music and, and the way in which the film filmmaker has full control over the film, um, ultimately it's really any, it's not any more truthful than narrative film because it is trying to tell a story. So, uh, reality, right. Can be manipulated in a whole series of ways through framing, reframing, editing, uh, the selection of shots, the music that is placed under it. All of these things are still part of the structure of the film, but they now sort of become less and less objective because I can put one piece of music under an interview with someone to make you feel absolute, you know, just joy to hear this person, or I can change it all together. And the music is so grating that now you just feel uncomfortable listening to this person. You start making, you know, value judgments on them. So the value judgments that are associated with these various, uh, types of visual or like image selections and framing and editing, the use of music and scripting, all those things create value judgments within the viewer about what they're seeing. So when that happens, that's no longer objective, is it? Right? Maybe authentic, quote unquote, but is it objective? Ultimately, every image that we see is mediated. And any film that is sort of, uh, you know, objectively capturing reality, with the exception of Andy Warhol's Empire, it's the only one I can think of, um, that idea is kind of naive because we, we know better. There, there's more going on. So just going to want to wrap up these slides here by just uh, talking very briefly about, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Leonard Cohen, film made in 1965. Um, the film does talk a little bit about who Leonard Cohen is. Um, and so he gets to do an awful lot of the talking. So what's happening here is Leonard Cohen is presenting to us Leonard Cohen. 
uh, there is no voiceover uh, narration. We're not being told to think about Leonard Cohen in a particular way. Uh, Cohen knows he's being photographed and filmed. He's aware of the presence of the camera. So he is uh, reflecting upon the fact that he's being filmed and that performative aspect of his, of his work. Because remember too, many times we see him performing. He's reading his poetry. So he is already performing for an audience that we see in the film, and then in turn also performing for the camera, uh, even implicitly, but it is there. Uh, what, what does Leonard Cohen say towards the tail end of the film? Caveat emptor, which is Latin for buyer beware. In other words, don't believe everything you see. Or what my favorite director, Jean Le Godard, once said, seeing is deceiving. So keep that in mind. Uh, what are the lines that uh, Cohen says in the film? I think I've had a very mistaken concept of the style of man I was. So there is a very powerful self-awareness of who Leonard Cohen is and who Leonard Cohen would like to present to the world. I mean, I've never met the man. Uh, I don't really feel one way or the other about him. He was an important figure in poetry, an important figure in Canadian music as, as well. But Leonard Cohen presented to the world a version of himself that may or may not be who he really is. But think about it. We all have those different facets, those different sides of ourselves that we present to our parents, to our friends, to our significant others. Uh, those are different versions of us. And Cohen is very aware of that and kind of points out, sort of hints at the fact that the version he presents to the camera may not be the real version of who he is. So there is, uh, you know, there is this notion that there is fabrication in that in that film. So there is manipulation and fabrication. Uh, Cohen reminds us that there is it is a construct, right? All media is a construct. Remember the clip from last week? And that's essentially what's happening here. This is what we're seeing uh, at play. So caveat emptor, let the buyer be well, uh, beware, sorry. So the main core, the main idea in this course then is to consider that the buyer beware and look at those documentary techniques so that we can then identify how the film pers persuades us to think in a certain way and not another. Does it close down alternatives? Does it make us think in a certain way? So in the sense, it tries to do what expository films do, but they do it in a more manipulative way. So cinematic persuasion exists in both documentary and fiction films. So we need to be aware of that. Okay, so I'm going to stop here and I'm going to load up the next set of slides, about 37 minutes. I know I talked a lot in this one, but in the others, we're going to just sort of talk briefly about uh, the films, uh, Nanook of the North and the John Grierson film. We're going to go to the John Grierson one next. And here we are with our second set of slides on John Grierson and Grifters. Uh, and right off the bat, again, we get a sense of uh, John Grierson's sort of his, uh, his mandate, right? I have no great interest in films as such. I look on cinema as a pulpit to be used, to use it as a propagandist. So he does not, uh, he doesn't mince words to, in terms of what he wishes to do with, with film, with, with the documentary tradition. He wishes to teach us things. So um, today, for or this week, I'm going to ask you to take a look at uh, Drifters, the first five or six minutes of it. Uh, I think six minutes and eight seconds exactly for the first fade out. I think that still gives you a sense of the film. By all means, do watch the rest of it. But uh, I want you to just kind of pay attention to, especially the way that it establishes a certain mood and establishes a certain sort of interaction between nature and culture or between nature the natural world and the world peopled by us uh, and then nanuka the north the other one okay so the sound era doesn't start till about halfway between these two films it starts in earnest in 1927 with a jazz uh, the jazz singer and it was not a documentary it was a it was a fiction film um but the sound film sort of takes a few years for for the gear to be uh of, you know available to the average person because it was simply just in hollywood at the time but both films uh, you'll see uh they are essentially silent films because they're so strongly visual there's so much going on visually that uh nanook of the north made in 1922 so literally 99 years ago 
All right, the film has what's called an intertitle. And intertitles are these sort of black and white sort of pieces of text that orient us into either what we have just seen or what we are about to see. But again, there's no confusion. Uh, Flaherty makes it very clear what it is we've just witnessed or what we are about to witness. So uh, the documentary existed in a sense before even voiceover narration. Uh, and that, that idea is really one of the most important uh, characteristics of the expository documentary. When we say the voice of God, right? Well, up until 1927, we couldn't even hear a voice. But what we do have is a clear expository nature to the construction of the images. The images are all at the service of a main idea. And so this is what happens where even a silent film is still clear in its mandate, clear in its decision to, to present to us certain things in, an, in a certain order. So uh, Nanook of the North, uh, there are some fabricated scenes that are reconstructed. So does the film lie? Uh, is that something that is terrible that we should, uh, we should chastise Flaherty for and, and dismiss it altogether? Uh, because you know what? I'll tell you one thing. It won't be the first, won't be the last time. So Nanook of the North does have, uh, staged and reconstructed events, but it's, it is still presented in the form of a documentary. So when we look at the last set of slides, we'll go in a little bit more detail on that. But it is important to know these particular things. Uh, John, John Grierson, uh, his involvement with the documentary tradition is that the fact he's uh, considered to have coined the word documentary, right? A document. Uh, and back in 1927, he was considered the father of the, of the documentary film. Uh, he founded the National Film Board here in Canada in 1939. Uh, he was a filmmaker himself and was working a decade before uh, creating films like uh, Drifters, you know, the herring uh, fishermen uh, of that particular area in England. So we get to see some some of their world. Now, often with both uh, Drifters and Nanook of the North, there is a sense of capturing something almost on a, not a, um, in terms of sort of an exploratory films, but an, an anthropological film. There is an anthropological view of what these people are doing, because in both cases, some of these things are no longer going to be around. Uh, in the case of drifters, there are things that individuals are doing that will soon be replaced by machines. Nanook of the North is full of sort of uh, what we would call, you know, older styles of hunting. Even though we know that Nanook and others, other uh, Inuit individuals, were using rifles by this point. But Flaherty wanted to capture a tradition that was rapidly disappearing. So we can cut him some slack because that's we know that's what he was trying to do, which is why he had to recreate some of these events. Now, no matter what, uh, Grierson saw himself more as an educator, a propagandist than, than an actual creative artist. Now, certainly there was creativity in the films that he made, and some of them are quite beautiful. Uh, in fact, the first five minutes of, of Drifters could be both poetic and expository. That's why they, the, the mode poetic I have problems with, because uh, there could be just a single sequence that could be considered poetic. And maybe that's what Bill Nicholas wanted us to consider uh, when we talk about that particular moment in the film. But primarily speaking, Grierson wanted to be an educator more so than an entertainer or an artist. And he wanted to simply help uh, the world develop. And he was all about planned societies and making, you know, individuals understand their role in that new society, uh, the various activities that are expected of us in this new state, uh, as more and more emphasis is placed on economics, technology especially becomes very important. And look at the time, in fact, when these were, were being made, uh, the early 20s and the late 20s. Well, these are films made just before the Depression. And when John Grierson came to Canada, uh, we were suffering a form of, of depression. Certainly, we were not immune to it. But the notion of central planning, the notion of trying to overcome this, this incredible obstacle, I, I just I cannot imagine what it would have been like to have lived during a Depression. But once this thing was sort of uh, gotten hold of and there was a way to see beyond it, uh, central planning was important. And so John Grierson wanted people to be on board and to understand what this thing was. So to educate the viewer was of paramount importance. So 
those people, the, the working class uh, or the lower middle class, we can see sort of the these are the people that are typically the subjects of John Grierson's films. Uh, the average working class citizen uh, typically didn't know enough about the world around them to make sort of wise political decisions. And this is something that really concerned Grierson. Um, and this is uh, ironically something that even in ancient Greece was important. Uh, Plato was saying the average, saying the same sort of thing that the average, you know, uh, uh, not proletariat in this case, but member of the demos, right? The, the demos are the people. Uh, Plato thought that the average person really was an idiot because they really didn't know much about, uh, you know, political machinery and and central planning and things that are beneficial to all, uh, because most individuals were concerned about their immediate surroundings and their their immediate welfare, and so Grierson, like Plato. Uh, wanted to take a large group of people, the working class, the ones, the individuals that move econ the economy along, and educate them. And he thought that the documentary tradition would be an excellent way to do that. Because yes, it was for the most part entertaining, but it was also educational. And the only way to revitalize democracy, and especially look at the time, 1939, uh, you know, after the war or in between the war, we wanted to make sure that democracy was not going to be crushed in the way that it had been in Germany, because that becomes very important. Uh, Spain, Italy, Germany, those three countries had basically fascist governments and democracy was crushed. So to allow people to understand that this idea, this notion of democracy is fragile and needs to be worked on all the time was one of the main reasons why Grierson really wanted to focus on education more so than simply entertainment. Uh, the National Film Board, of course, no big surprise, was actually funded or is funded still in Canada by the Canadian government. So it is a kind of, well, if you want to be really cynical about it, it's a propaganda arm of the Canadian government. But that's not to say that every film is is glowingly talking about the Canadian government. Far from it. Uh, there is a certain degree of of freedom within the NFB to make films about a variety of different subjects, but there is still that relationship between the funding of the National Film Board and the Canadian government, who happens to be the funding arm. So that relationship is allegedly at arm's length, but uh, it is still there, and there's a reason for it because. The National Film Board was initially used for educational purposes. So, Drifters, and I'm going to ask you to watch that short little bit at the beginning. Um, again, a good example of the creative treatment of actuality. Uh, shots are picked and selected because, because of the way they work together. They kind of cumulatively give us a sense of something happening. Um, Grierson says they're asked to reproduce their everyday life under these artificial conditions. The fishermen respond, responded magnificently. They turned in for then night, got up to haul, cooked, conversed at their meals, swore at the cook, um, and they were on the high seas 50 miles away. This was all good stuff, right? This is, this is what filmmakers, you know, just crave for, like actuality, people interacting with one another, interacting with their environment. And this is what made the film really good. So uh, the last one for uh, Grierson, the idea that a mirror held up to nature is not so important in a dynamic and fast changing world as the hammer which shapes it. It is as a hammer, not as a mirror, that I have sought to use a medium that came to my somewhat restive hands. Wow. Okay. So hammers shape things. So the documentary film is a kind of hammer that, well, hammers can hurt, you know, they can pummel people. But use, think of it as a tool, right? The notion of a hammer as a tool uh, between the mind and between language or between the mind and instead of language, the documentary film. We're going to shape that world in such a way that it makes sense to you and you will learn something. And the notion that it is a fast changing world. Uh, what has happened over the last, well, the last century from 1900 to 2000 is nothing short of remarkable. If you do any reading on history, history sort of progresses at a certain rate, but it almost sort of went at 10 times the speed over the last 100 years, not one, but two world wars, uh, many skirmishes all through all through the, you know, South America, Southeast Asia, parts of Africa, colonial wars, uh, the end of colonialism, as, as we know, it, the invention of the computer, 
automation. So many things have happened, and yet not having films to help us to understand it would really cause a tremendous amount of confusion in people. So to get back to the creative treatment of actuality, um, there is this staging of reality, which is really uh, part of what makes these two films work really well together. Uh, the shots of the fish, the very careful editing, uh, recreating the boats on shore, all these things are all part of uh, a certain world that Grierson wishes to present to us. Now, one thing that uh, Grierson was aware of and uh, really thought favorably of was all of the work that was being done in the Soviet Union at that time, uh, what was known as the Soviet montage style. And uh, Sergei Eisenstein is the sort of the main person uh, that uh, had come up with theories about how shots should work together and what happens when we, we put together, sort of we string together three different images and what is going on here because you're just not sort of arbitrarily placing things next to each other just because you shot them in that order doesn't mean they need to be presented in that order now here's a little clue when we watch warndale the film ends with an event that occurred in reality at the beginning so the filmmaker uh, alan king decides to take this event and place it at the end of the film when in fact in reality it had occurred at the very beginning and he doesn't tell us that until much later so it gives us a very different sense of what the film is about now that's not soviet montage specifically but what i'm getting at is the construction of the medium the construction of the film itself and eisenstein really uh, had some interesting ideas and he's writing in the 1920s right so a hundred years ago some of the ideas that he was presenting uh in terms of of fast paced editing slower paced editing uh would really do things to us uh the other is the kuleshov effect uh, the idea of placing two things together and somehow we come up with a third meaning so we see for example a bowl of soup and then we see a person that we think appears to be hungry so we're thinking in our minds oh that person is looking at that bowl of soup and he's really hungry so we should let him have it those two shots could have been taken five years apart but we put them together and our minds create this third meaning and the first two is of course the bowl of soup the image of the person and that third thing that meaning is what we come up with in our minds so documentary filmmakers learned that very very quickly so um, Soviet montage uh, is something that was used in fiction films but uh, let's let's be honest here the Soviet experience with fiction films often based on actual events uh, celebrations of the revolution uh, celebrations of great historical figures and Eisenstein had learned these things uh, quite early uh, in terms of what he wanted to what did he what he wanted to accomplish in terms of the education uh, that he wished to impart in his viewers and he learned that you could actually manipulate the, uh, the image in such a way that you would now uh, almost like Pavlov's dog have a, an expected reaction if I put th these two shots together it will result in this or typically okay uh, very briefly uh, briefly sorry on the reading quiz uh, the textbook uh, chapter the first one uh, it's essentially an open book. If you are taking notes, I can't stop you from using those. Uh, so you're going to be uh, using the the textbook, uh, your notes, and you will have a chance to uh, to read through it and then be able to organize your ideas uh, accordingly. So the reading quiz is going to be based on basically the notes that you have created. Um, so when if you have them, however you want to structure it, but it will be a quiz on the readings for this week on Nanook of the North, so will the viewing quiz be. And it's basically 15 to 20 multiple choice questions. And um, if you are going to read through these essays, if you do like me, you can either use a highlighter or you can underline certain words. Um, and so however you want to do it to, to remember things, it's enter entirely up to you. So um, if you take notes, uh, that will really help you. Uh, and of course, hang on to those notes too when, when you do the final, uh, the final test, because the final exam will have questions based on the viewings of the films or the viewing of the films and also on the readings. So keep that in mind. Don't toss them out. 
Okay, so that's the end of uh, this shorter little section here. We're up to about 50, almost 55 minutes. So I'm going to pause here for a moment, and I'm going to load up the last uh, set of slides on Nanook. And so here we are with our feature presentation, Nanook of the North, Robert Flaherty, 1922. Uh, and this is just a very brief quote uh, by Francis Flaherty, his, uh, his wife. Uh, and she says, Robert Flaherty loved primitive people. Uh, that's not like in a condescending way. He truly did uh, like and preferred their simplicity, their dignity, the fact that they were living freely, they're living off the land. They had a sense of courage and generosity that he did not find in, in the urban population, we'll say. But he found this in, well, we call it Eskimo life, Inuit life. Uh, and so this is kind of the ideas that were in the back of Flaherty's mind when he was filming Nanook of the North. He wanted to try to capture that dignity, simplicity, courage, generosity. All those things are and were important to Flaherty. So the question becomes, how are you going to, how are you going to realize that? How are you going to visualize dignity and simplicity and these kinds of things? And this is what really he thought about as he put his film together. Now, the notion of simplicity, um, this is an idea of sort of, you know, a certain group of individuals living differently from ourselves. And we have a kind of romanticized uh, view of their life. And I don't think anyone would, could kid themselves for one second to believe that life up there is harsh. It has to be uh, because uh, it is openly hostile to individuals, and yet people somehow can eke out a, an existence there. So the notion of simplicity, uh, well, compared to what? They don't have as many stereos and TVs? Well, no, of course not. But simplicity just means barren, right? They are left to their own devices. Uh, they are really one with nature. So simplicity in that sense, yes, it may be slightly romanticized, but what Flaherty is talking about is, you know, this is the world that is both br brutal and beautiful. And it's the way in which these individuals, the Inuit population, have learned to survive in an otherwise hostile climate. So the evidence that, that we see, there's a whole range of things that are going on uh, in terms of the, the film that is being made. I'm just going to grab my notes here, I think. Yes, good. Um, so uh, you could ask yourself as you watch the film, is Robert Flaherty romanticizing the Inuit way of life? Uh, is he sort of downplaying the harshness and the ho open hostility of that environment uh, for the sake of, a, of an interesting shot? So keep that in mind as you watch it. Um, one of the things that we do know from uh, Flaherty's interviews after the fact is he wanted the Inuit uh, population, Nanook in particular, to use older weapons like harpoons, even though we knew and he knew that hunters were traditionally using rifles, even that early point. So what Flaherty wanted to do was to capture, almost as an anthropologist, something that was fading very quickly. Uh, this was a way of life for many, many years, and it was now being sort of changed and modernized through the use of rifles. And so by showing Nanook doing things sort of the old fashioned way, the more traditional way, the film is not only a document of what used to be, but it is staged recreations of what used to be. So we need to keep that in mind. So it is uh, a restructuring of reality. The film still records what's going on in front of it, but things to a certain degree are staged to look a certain way, to capture this old traditional style of living. Um, there's also the notion that that Nanook has very little, if any, contact with the Western world, when in fact he did. Uh, the trading posts there were quite, were quite common. Uh, Hudson's Bay had uh, operations up there. Uh, they would buy pelts from, from the Inuit population and bring them down south to, to make coats out of them. So Flaherty's idea of the noble savage is something that we see being presented in the film. Uh, and this is an idea that uh, it starts in the 16th, actually that's correct, it should be the 18th century, my mistake. Um, I mean, you can go back, uh, Afra Ben writing in England, it was in the 1500s, but it's really Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau that you see here. He's the one that popularizes this notion of the noble savage, that uncumbered by society and civilization and political structures, that's really truly what humanity should be. And that's the normal idea of humanity. And once that individual comes into contact with what he says, the hands of man, and he means all this social, political, cultural, technological, uh, you know, institutions, 
we somehow are belittled or somehow uh, diluted and that essence of humanity is somehow degraded because of our interaction with these artificial systems. That's essentially what Rousseau was talking about. So um, Nanook uh, is, is an interesting film. Uh, this notion that Nanook is uncumbered by civilization, uh, well, he, they, they have to eat. And of course, you know, they've got to keep themselves alive. And yes, they do. They do hunt and they do uh, eat the food that they that they hunt. But are they uncumbered from civilization? Uh, the fact that their civilization is fading and their traditions are fading already tells us that, no, they are encumbered. Right. Civilization is encroaching because there is a new way of life just on the horizon, if not all, if not already there. So encumbered? No. Actually, there is an awareness that things are about to change. And this is why Flaherty wishes to depict his people sort of in their struggles the way that they were, because he knew that hunters were now using rifles. And it was, in fact, much easier and safer to uh, to hunt than the way that we see Nanook uh, trying to hunt for seal and walrus and so on in the film. Now, I mentioned uh, at the very beginning of this, where we're talking about uh, intertitles, and these are intertitles that you see. Uh, here we can see in deference to Nanook, the great hunter, the trader entertains and attempts to explain the principle of the gramophone, how the white man cans his voice. So there is the equivalent of the voice of God now either commenting on something we've just seen. I'm not sure exactly where it appears in this sequence, but it either is going to tell us how to view and think and interpret what is just about to happen right after or what has just been uh, seen. So this kind of thing, uh, the, the intertitles, help to guide us through our understanding of the film. It works like a voice of God, but it was made before, uh, before sound, unfortunately. So let's keep in mind that many of the events in Nanook were staged. Uh, the walrus hunt and the seal hunt were staged. The creation of the igloos was staged. The family structure, uh, which is in fact quite different, um, polygamy is practiced in uh, the Inuit culture, but there's no mention of that in Flaherty's film. Uh, and it was probably the likelihood that people would be confused or offended in some way uh, by the fact that polygamy is practiced and this it's, it's not a big deal. It's just what they do. But there is a real sense that Nanook and his wife and their, and their kids, you know, are this sort of uh, traditional bourgeois sort of family dynamics when in fact polygamy was the order of the day. So there, there's a little bit of sort of restructuring of, of, of the truth. Um, the interaction with Nanook and the, uh, the uh, individual at the trading post, you know, biting the, the record, it's meant for humor's effect. Uh, but clearly, Nanook would have known what that thing was. And finally, when we talk about honesty and truth, the editing, how it's actually structured. And that is something we need to keep in mind. So the creative uh, treatment of actuality, that's what Robert Flaher Flaherty is doing well before Gre uh, Grierson even says it, because that's what he does. That's what he's in the process of doing. He's got a story he wishes to tell, and he was the first to admit, sometimes you have to lie, right? You need to distort something in order to capture its true essence. To uh, identify the essence of something, you have to sometimes leave other things out. So ask yourself as you're watching it, because you will know that some of these scenes are staged, they're quite dramatic and gripping, and they really present uh, Nanook sort of, uh, you know, almost at war with the elements and at war with, you know, the animal world. But at the same time, they were staged. So ask yourself whether or not that's dishonest. Because remember, Flaherty is trying to film something that's about to disappear, right? This, this uh, way of living, this way of life is rapidly disappearing because civilization is encroaching. It is encumbering upon the civilization that uh, in, uh, that Nanook is representing. So um, it is a full-length documentary before the word even existed, uh, and that's still worth uh, considering. And we are left with some big questions. Uh, did Flaherty orchestrate certain uh, events? Yes, he did. But he was also trying to do it in such a way that he would be allowed that kind of creative license to present to us something which is, was about to disappear, right? It was about to be over for good. We would literally have no documentation of it. So uh, Roger Ebert, uh, Ebert in his review of the Nuke of the North, 
He says, look, the film is not technically sophisticated. How could it be? One camera, no lights, freezing cold, everybody at the mercy of nature. But it has an authenticity that prevails over any complaints that some of the sequences were staged. Because if you stage a walrus hunt, it still, still involves hunting a, a walrus. And the walrus hasn't seen the script, which is kind of humorous, but it's true. It was an actual, it was an actual walrus. It was an actual hunt, but it was done in a way that uh, we were able to, or Flaherty was able to capture in essence, you know, that struggle between man and animal as man tries to assert its domination over it and get food. So that's the part that really works. Uh, none of this was shot using lightweight uh, handheld cameras. These are bulky cameras uh, that overheat. And for example, uh, shooting inside the igloo, uh, they had actually built a spe special igloo with one of the walls removed so we could see inside and it was shot during daylight. Um, so these kinds of things, I mean, this is uh, breaking the fourth wall, we'll say, for example, because uh, we see this happening and we never think about it. How many sitcoms seem to take place inside one room? We seem to always be in the living room and we see, you know, one wall on one side, one on the other, one on the back and the camera and we are essentially that fourth wall. Well, Flaherty, as early as 1922, took advantage of this kind of thinking and did the same thing. Took out a chunk of the, the igloo so the camera could be that fourth wall or the other half of it. Now, do we feel violated in some way? We shouldn't because it was simply something that had to be done. So the walrus and the seal, uh, the, you know, these two hunts, um, what, what Nanook wanted to do was that the film uh, want, well, wanted to uh, argue in favor of that the film should come first, right? Uh, if things are dangerous, then that would make it more gripping as a, as a film, in, engage the viewer even more. Uh, so what was happening was uh, it, the Flaherty was watching and making sure that everything was okay, but it was also through editing that Nanook's peril looks in fact more dangerous than it really is because you can insert other shots into it uh, into that a certain sequence, the, the seal hunt, the walrus hunt, to, you know, like breaking ice and things like that. Oh my God, now, okay, how close is that? Is Nanu going to, you know, slip through the water, etc.? It really sets us up to think in certain ways about Nanook, and it engages the viewer. This is something that's very important. Now, one thing that is uh, worthy of remembering is that the documentary mode and the docu documentary tradition is at this point very, very young. So the modes of documentary haven't been developed. We have only really one expository. Um, the, the long take is uh, something that became a useful tool for maintaining reality, truth, and veracity, all those things. Because a long take does not involve editing. It will be a single camera focused on one thing, and it could be a person walking across a landscape or in and out of a room, but the long take gives us at least the appearance of reality because editing has not re, re uh, constructed or reshaped that space or in fact reshaped time because with editing you can you can play with time and with space the long take does neither it is a more honest portrayal of what we're seeing in front of us so uh cutting for continuity is important because we need to know what's going on uh, but there is a, are a lot of long takes, beautiful takes in this film. Um, and the result is that we're able to simply stand back and watch the, the events occurring in what appears to be real time, which is a remarkable thing. So even at this point with a, with a bulky, heavy camera. Um, there are also uh, techniques with uh, shorter uh, distances, focal distances. Uh, it appears that uh, you know, we've got these long shots with uh, Nanook is really part of that landscape. Uh, there's a scene quite early where we see Nanook coming at us from a great distance and it's a long take. So we see just how long it takes to travel. But medium shots and the occasional close up, not very many of them, but medium shots allow us to see things up close in the sense of, you know, the, the, the tools, the weapons, the gear that Nanook is using. Uh, he's linking with nature, uh, you know, the icing for the wal wal the walrus knife, uh, cooking with stone pots, all these things that we get to see uh, sort of, in a sense, up close 
as almost anthropologists. You know, this is what they this is what they were using back then. Uh, camera angles uh, again. When we talk about uh, camera angles, they can be very manipulative. They typically are an extreme high or low angle shot can really change our perceptions of someone. Uh, camera angles come with value judgments. Think of it that way. So if uh, that is the case, Flaherty, for the most part, we use, was using eye level shots for many of these uh, of these sequences. So there are no point of view shots, what's called a POV shot. There are no point of view shots, which means what Nanook is looking at, we now get to see what it is. Uh, he and the thing that he is you know, grappling with or struggling with, uh, we see together. So really, ultimately, everything is taken from the camera's perspective. Nanook is the subject of the film, but this is all we see, just what the camera is seeing, not what Nanook is seeing. So we've got, um, for, the, for the most part, level or eye level shots, many long takes, some medium shots, some deep focus shots uh, to give us a sense of the, the, the width and breadth of the landscape, the hostility of that landscape, uh, some deep focus shots for the, the uh, fox and the seal hunt. That's also important. Okay, so in the end, we have to ask ourselves, did Flaherty intend to make a documentary or was he just trying to tell us a story uh, about the way these people were, were living? Because there was no real template at that time as to what a, docu a documentary film was. It's only in hindsight that we were able to go back and look and go, well, what Flaherty created qualifies as a documentary as we understand it, say, 10 years later. So really all flatter flattery was trying to do um, was document this ancient tradition, this Inuit tradition before it disappeared completely. So it was a look into a culture that was just on the fringes of dying away. And yes, some scenes were restaged, but it was for the benefit of the viewer to get to see kind of something that had been around for hundreds of years as it was about to disappear. But before it did, here we have someone named Nanook that knew what to do who knew actually how to how to hunt in this particular way. So um, that's essentially it. Uh, the, this video is about an hour, 10 minutes, almost 12 minutes. So I presented to you a, a lot of information, I know, but do take the time to go through and watch in its entirety, Nanook of the North, uh, Drifters, the first six minutes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Leonard Cohen, but the first five minutes, but also importantly, the last the last 10 minutes of it because uh, some interesting things are going on uh, in those particular films, but just watch sections of Drifter, uh, Drifters and ladies and gentlemen, Leonard Cohen. Also too, don't forget about the reading quiz and the, and the writing quiz, or the sort of the, not the writing, the reading quiz and the viewing qu uh, quiz. Uh, those two we'll have a chance to talk about when we meet again on, uh, I believe on Wednesday. So we'll see each other then. So in the meantime, take care and happy viewing.